Hey there students, in this lecture I'm going to introduce you to the Franks. The Franks were a very important group of people who were instrumental in the foundation of medieval Europe and also who are responsible for giving us modern France, which has a special place in the history and the heart of the world. So with that, let's go ahead and clarify where we are. We've got three periods of history, ancient, medieval, and modern. And what we're going to be looking at is really the early part of the Middle Ages. So the Roman Empire at the death of Constantine, it spanned from Britain all the way to Egypt and the Middle East. Now, of course, in the 4th century and 5th century, barbarian invasion started to chip at the Roman Empire until it finally fell. Now, in the mid-5th century, the Vandals came into Rome and they sacked the place, pillaged it so thoroughly that we get the word Vandal from that where people destroy property and we call it vandalism after the vandal sack of Rome in 455 and you can see on this map that Rome is being divided up between all of these different tribes the Ostrogoths the Visigoths the Vandals and the Franks as we see in their beginnings in modern-day Belgium and Germany in 476 AD, Rome finally fell to barbarian invaders for good. And so we see the beginnings of what will create, for a time at least, a medieval empire that the Franks are going to build that's going to rival that of the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic Caliphate. The Byzantine Empire, of course, being the remnant of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. And so the Frankish kingdom grew over several hundred years from its beginnings to what we see here that's going from northern Spain to Italy, all of France, Belgium, the Netherlands today, and Switzerland, and even into Austria and Germany. That around the beginning of the 9th century, they were the power to be reckoned with in Western Europe. Now, the history of the Franks as a united entity began with Clovis I, who was the first to rule a united Frankish kingdom at the beginning of the 6th century. Now, not only did Clovis unite the Franks, but he also converted to Catholic Christianity. Before that, the Franks had still been a pagan tribe. With Clovis converting to Catholic Christianity, now note other barbarian tribes have been Christianized, but a lot of them had adopted a rival form of Christianity known as Arian Christianity, which said that Jesus was not fully God, that he was a divine being, but somewhere lower than God the Father. So Clovis decided to adopt Trinitarian Catholic Christianity, which of course had consequences for the development of Western Europe. Now the Carolingian house, these are the rulers who are there when the Franks are at their zenith, at their high point. Charles Martel, Pepin the Short, and Charlemagne. The Islamic Caliphate had expanded all the way through North Africa and through the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal, and finally came into the territory of the Franks in the 8th century. At the Battle of Tours in 732, Charles Martel defeated the Islamic armies and halted Islamic expansion into Western Europe. And because of this victory, he was given the nickname The Hammer, Charles the Hammer Martel. Now, Charles was not the king of the Franks, but he was the mayor of the palace. He was the person who was really kind of running things, even though he wasn't the king. This is a 19th century depiction of the Battle of Tours. Now, this is by a romantic artist, which romantics in the 19th century tended to be uh, very nostalgic about the Middle Ages and also very religious. We see here that this is not just a military conflict, but you see that these knights are defending Christianity. We see the defensive posture of the French. We see that the Muslims are even darkened for effect. And in the very middle, you see a woman holding a child where there is this knight defending her. And then there is this man with his sword that he's swinging to kill. And so we see here that for Christian Europe, this is a 
huge turning point as far as ensuring that Europe will remain Christian and specifically Catholic. Now, Pepin the Short was Charles Martel's son, and he wasn't satisfied with just being the second in command, the mayor of the palace. He usurped the kingship of the Franks, but it was okay because he had the Pope's blessing. He went to the Bishop of Rome and he asked, I don't know if he physically went, but in some way he inquired of the Bishop of Rome and the Bishop of Rome said, there you go. Go get him, Tiger. And so the Carolingian dynasty was founded by Pepin the Short. The Carolingian dynasty meaning the House of Charles. Pepin the Short wasn't nearly as important as his son. Carolus Magnus in Latin, Charles the Great in English, or Charlemagne as we tend to call him, or as the French would call him, Charlemagne. Charlemagne, I, I, I don't know. My French is notoriously bad, but it's a written test. I'm just going to stick with Charlemagne, okay? Now, Charlemagne was the most powerful and most famous ruler of Europe in the early Middle Ages. We can see here at the peak of Charlemagne's power how you've got the Frankish Empire, this Carolingian Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and the Islamic Caliphate. Charlemagne was also instrumental in securing the Pope's position as the leader of Christians during the Middle Ages. In the late 8th century, Charlemagne saved the Pope from his enemies in Italy. He brought an army across the Alps and he came to help the Pope. Now, in appreciation of that, on Christmas Day of 800, the Pope crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans. After all, he had brought his army into Rome, so now you are the Roman Emperor. Of course, the Eastern Romans were not uh, too happy about that, but there was really nothing that they could do at the time. Now, this, of course, contributed to tensions between Eastern Europe and Western Europe uh, over this existence of two Roman empires. But Charlemagne accepted this honor that I don't think he knew was coming in advance. I think it was something of a surprise if we're to believe the historical sources that we have. Now, Charlemagne was so legendary that Napoleon, a thousand years later, when he was having this iconic portrait painted by Jacques-Louis David of the Emperor Napoleon, or at that time, uh, the General Napoleon, crossing the Alps, okay? So Napoleon had led a campaign into Italy before he was Emperor of France. And in this painting, we can see here in the bottom left corner, there's Bonaparte, Napoleon's last name, and we see a bit of Hannibal, who famously crossed the Alps during the Second Punic War to attack the Romans, and then Carolus Magnus, his Latin name, because neoclassical art is all about looking back and idealizing the Romans. And so with this, Hannibal, Carolus Magnus, Bonaparte, Napoleon, in order to project himself as someone great, not only compares himself to Hannibal, but compares himself also to Charlemagne. We have these three legendary military commanders, all of whom cross the Alps. And so the Frankish kingdom at this time is spanning throughout Western Europe. Uh, we see here just a massive kingdom, but it was not to last. After the death of Charlemagne, his kingdom was actually divided between his three sons, who then proceeded to fight each other. There's all kinds of stuff going on that we're not going to go into in an introductory lecture, but in 843, the Treaty of Verdun established these three distinct kingdoms. And so the Frankish kingdom itself came to an end. It would not last. And so what we see here, though, is even though it didn't last, the Franks definitely left their mark. And that's including when we think about the establishment of the Holy Roman Empire in the 10th century. Now, this was a Germanic confederation in Central Europe, but the idea of a Roman Empire that was ruled by Germans, this is something that when they made Charlemagne the king, this is, you know, Charlemagne wasn't a Roman and neither were the rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. But this idea started with the crowning of Charlemagne as the Roman Emperor. So in the high and late Middle Ages, we see here this Holy Roman Empire and then this Eastern Roman, or as historians call it, Byzantine Empire. This is the way things look about 1000 AD at the peak of the high Middle Ages. The difference here is that while 
the Byzantine Empire was governed as a centralized state. Western Europe is going to be governed through most of the Middle Ages as feudal states after the collapse of this Carolingian Empire that never really quite came together as a unitary state. So going into the legacies of the Franks. First, the Franks laid the foundation for the Kingdom of France. Then, they established Catholic Christianity as the religion of Western Europe. They secured the Pope's position as the leader of Christians in Western Europe and gave Europe the idea of a Roman Empire that was ruled by Germans, okay? Because even though Charlemagne was a Frank, these Franks are really about as German as they were French. And hopefully you enjoyed that lecture. If you want to hear more lectures on European history and, of course, plenty of other history as well, feel free to subscribe to my channel. Plenty of good stuff where this came from. It is always a pleasure.